Praise the Lord, saints. Pastor Daryl Scott here once again, senior pastor at New Spirit Revival Center Church, Cleveland Heights, Ohio. We're going to go into the Word of God again on tonight. I believe I have something that can be a benefit and a blessing to you if you have an ear to hear and a heart to receive. The theme of the message uh, or the teaching on tonight is principles and precepts of productivity. Principles and precepts of productivity. You know, um, so many saints, well, not just the saints, people in general desire to be productive in life. They desire to be productive in life. If you're a believer, you desire to be productive in life and you desire to be productive in God. You know, you want to be productive spiritually and productive naturally or materially. I mean, we live in a material world. We live in a natural world. As a result, we want to be productive in the natural but by virtue of the new birth, we also are residents, amen, of the kingdom of God, citizens, amen, of the kingdom of God. And we desire to be productive spiritually as well. And I believe that this can help you tonight. Once again, as I always state, if you have a need to hear and heart to receive, in the sense that if you desire to be productive, there are some principles, there are some precepts that are in the word of God that will aid and assist us in our endeavors, amen. What did Peter say? The, according to his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain to life. That's the natural world. And godliness. That's the spiritual dimension of our life. God has given us precepts and principles in his word that can enhance us in this natural life and in our spiritual walk with him. So we're going to go into the word of God. I guarantee you'll be blessed. Amen. If you so desire to. And we'll be back afterwards and chop it up. All right. When you're there, say amen. Let's read. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can you except you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered and men gathered him and cast him into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit. So shall you be my disciples. Verse 15, henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knows not what his Lord does. But I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Father, bless us tonight as we study your word. In Jesus' name, let the church say amen. amen. May be seated in the presence of the Lord. Every branch, verse 2, in me that beareth not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. One more time, every branch in me, every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. Every branch in me that bears not fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he purges it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, why is the gnat up here trying to pick with me? Who bought, who bought the gnat in? Who got gnats at home? Y'all know how you used to do when you find roaches in your house. Some, who, somebody, they, they can we left the door open. And the roads came from next door. <laughs> they don't know nothing about that. Notice, notice, look, look at verse 2. The phrase where it says, every branch in me 
that bears not fruit, he takes away. That passage of scripture right there is very suggestive in its implications and in its insinuations and interpretations. Jesus begins by stating that these branches are in him, which speaks of believers. Amen. It speaks of salvation. It speaks of the saints of God, branches in him him. The Bible says, if any man beware in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself and has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. So if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Amen. Then he's, so he states here that if a believer is fruitful, amen, they are purged to produce more fruit. Now he says they're in him. The ones that are in him that aren't fruitful, he takes away. The ones that are in him that are fruitful, he purges. If they're fruitless, they're taken away. Or they're removed from what? Being a part of the vine. Now, the Bible states in verse 6, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. And men gathered them and cast them into the fire and they are burned. Say amen. Now, it's significant to notice that God does this. Man doesn't do it. God does the taking away. God does the removing. Man doesn't do it. No man is able to remove a branch from God's hand. But God himself can and a person can remove themselves. So we are told in this passage once again that there are two kinds or there are two types of branches. Those that are fruitful and those that are fruitless. Look at that person next to you and, and, and just say, mm-hmm. <laughs> well, and lift your eyebrows a little bit and kind of side eye. Which one are you? No, no, don't be a fruit inspector. Say amen. It's not our job to be fruit inspectors. But there are two types of or kinds of branches. The branches that are fruitful, branches that are fruitless, which then compels the comp consideration, saints, that it is possible to come into relationship with Jesus Christ, who the Bible says is the true vine. And it, it's possible to become a part of this vine and to be in this vine and yet not bring forth any fruit. Say amen. And we learn then that to be related to him, to be related to the Lord, yet to be non-productive or unproductive, it's insufficient to secure eternal life, and it's also insu insufficient to maintain and retain one's salvation. Don't shout me now. In other words, there are believers who have been born again, and they are in the Lord, but because of bringing forth no fruit, because they have fruitless Christian uh, walks, and despite the efforts of God, they continue to be unproductive they will ultimately be taken away. They will ultimately be removed from the vine. I'll get you there. Now, verse 2 continues by stating, saints, that the branch that does bear fruit will be purged. Help me, Holy Ghost. Which in the Greek, the word purge means to cleanse as in to make pure. Let's go a little bit deeper. Many people, most people today in the body of Christ, most of the people that you know in the church, they wrongly interpret purging, thinking that it's something bad or that it's something destructive when your life is being purged or when your church is being purged. I mean, they think of it as something bad, as if it's some kind of punishment. But what they don't seem to realize is that the purging is not because of a lack of fruit. Amen. Actually, it's because of the very opposite. God sees the fruit. Help me, Holy Ghost. God sees the fruit in your life. But at the same time, God sees the potential you have to bear much more fruit. So consequently, he purges the branch so that it can bring forth more fruit of greater quality and of greater quantity. Say amen. I remember when I was a kid, when we first moved over to my father's house, 1965, we had an apple tree in the backyard. 
You know, that's one thing you don't see in the city anymore. Everybody, we had an apple tree in the backyard and we had a, a Japanese cherry tree on the front yard. And you know, tree, that was part of our childhood. Like, Mr. Mr. Miller's got a plum tree over on 148th Street. And you go around there with your bag. And there'd be 20 kids up in that tree. And you have to help them get out because you don't want to get the stuff that fell on the ground. You want to get up in that tree and pick. It'd be a bunch of kids. And he'd come outside, get out that tree. And we all jump down and run. And, but that was part, you know, it was trees every. We heard where the grapevine was. And we knew who had the cherry trees. And we knew who had the, you know, you don't see, you don't see that in the, in the city these days. You don't see it anywhere. But we had an apple tree in the backyard. And when we were little, those apples were big. And big, good green apples. You put some salt on them. Big, nice. But my father didn't take care of the tree. He didn't prune that tree. He didn't, he didn't do anything. Just the tree was there. And you looked up, and, and, and years later, the apples were getting smaller and smaller, and they kept worms in them, and, and now the tree ain't even back there no more. But, you know, they, they didn't take care of the tree. Amen. It needed to be purged. It needed to be purged so that it could do what? Bring forth more Amen. And better fruit. Verse 3 says, Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Which means that the cleansing effort of the purging is brought on by the word of God. He says you have to be purged, but then we know purging means to be cleaned or cleansed. And he says you are clean too. The word, so, so the word is the agent for the cleansing, amen, for the purging. In other words, the vine dresser, the husband man, which Jesus says in verse 1, is the father. He says the father, the husband man, he does whatever is necessary to bring one's life into accordance with his word. But watch this now. This purging or this cleansing, it does not come quickly, nor does it come easy. Job is a perfect example of it. His story explains why good, God-fearing people are afflicted and which is to contribute to one's sanctification. Amen. Why do good people go through bad things to make the good people better people? Help me, Holy Ghost. God uses tests. God uses trials. God uses calamities. God uses catastrophe as his instrument in creating character and to making saints partakers of his divine nature and partakers of his holiness. Because how many of you know the tests and trials reveal depths of an individual's being that could not be revealed in any other way. Tests and trials will re reveal things in you that you yourself didn't know were there, especially when the tests and trials are connected to people. How many of you know people can bring some stuff out of you that you did not even know was inside of you? So God observes your life and God sees the fruit, God sees the produce, God sees the product, God sees the productivity of your life, amen. But he also sees the potential that's in your life as well. So God allows a purging in order to maximize your potential and increase your productivity. That's why God allows you to go through what you go through even though you're not living in sin and you're not walking in sin and you're doing what's right and you're in his word and his word is in you it's his word in you that's causing you to go through even though you're working for the kingdom and working for the Lord and being fruitful in your labors for the Lord and fruitful in your Christian walk in your life he still will allow you to go through because God sees so much more in you that he wants to bring out of you so he'll use tests, he'll use trials, he'll use trouble, he'll use travail, he'll use tribulations in order to identify and to eliminate the negative aspects and elements of your life in order to identify and accentuate the positive aspects and elements of your life. So he purges some things out, out of your life. He purges some things out of your, out of your, your entire sphere, amen. He'll purge some friends, he'll purge some relationships, He'll purge some possessions. You've got to realize that. Remember now, to purge means to cleanse. 
to clean up, to clean out. He cleans some things out of your life. He cleanses some things out of your life that unbeknown to you are interfering with your ability to be more productive, to be more prolific, to be more effective, to be more fruitful. He cleans some things or cleans some people out of your life that prevent you from advancing to another level physically, spiritually, mentally, or materially. How many of you will admit that there are some people in your life that are like Job's friends? They secretly delight in your adversity. They secretly delight when you're going through. They secretly delight in your disenfranchisement. And they desire to uncover and they desire to un uh, observe your flaws and your imperfections. And how many of you will also admit that you have some internal issues as well that you need to deal with? Things that are on the inside of you your pride or your stubbornness your mindset amen your your insecurities your ego your inferiority complex your superiority complex God purges you of these things through the issues and the vicissitudes of life in order for you to become more fruitful and more productive for the kingdom of the Lord that's why the Bible says Job was blessed twice as much after his purging because God used his trial to remove from his life things that interfered with his reception of the double-fold blessing. And you're going to see yourself more blessed. Somebody say, help me, Lord. You're going to see yourself more blessed after you examine yourself, after you allow God to purge you, after you come out of your problem, after your issue is settled, after do you get certain people out of your life? You want me to help you with the process? You want to know how to purge people out of your life? Stop letting them use you. Stop letting them drain you. Stop letting them leech off of you. Stop being that safety net. Stop playing Santa Claus. Stop letting them get away with any and everything they want to get away with. I know I'm preaching good. Oh, they'll run quick, fast, and in a hurry. When they find out that they don't have you to kick around anymore. Let God purge those blood suckers out of your life. I don't care if they're friend or family. And watch your life become more productive. And watch your life become more fruitful. Because that will be another distraction that you don't have to deal with. That will be another element that's not draining you and taking your attention away from yourself. I told y'all this year is going to be the year for you. Say amen to me. Can I keep going? The Bible says that the word cleansed the vine by removing the fruitless branches. Jesus said, I am the vine. In other words, the body of Christ is bettered. The church is better by removing non-productive, unfruitful members and leaders from its midst. Don't shout me down. He purges the fruitful. That's why it seems like the good saints go through while the bad saints, the bad doing saints, don't. Let me tell you some trials will make you look around. But I know this, I know what they doing. I know what he did. I know how this one lives. I know how that one is. Why am I messed up and they're not? You know, certain trials make you hate everybody. I remember my sister Robin told me, she said, when mommy died, I hated everybody. <laughs> hey, how many of y'all ever had a parent die? Hey, don't it make you hate everybody? <laughs> yeah. I remember when my, my brother and sister had the goldfish and, and, and they had both their goldfish in the little tank and my brother's fish died. And then we went in there and looked and, and, and Robin's fish was in two halves. <laughs> it was the tail over here, the head over there. Oh, my fish died, then your fish died too. You know? <laughs> I feel him though, I feel his pain. But if trials will make you feel like I'm doing bad, well, then everybody going to have to do bad then. Say amen. But it seems as if the good saints do bad and the bad saints do good. 
How many of you know what I'm talking about? But the Bible says he removes the unfruitful. That's why it seems as if the carnal, bad doing, non-productive, headache, murmuring, dis, 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 dissatisfied, complaining, sinful, carnal, worldly saints don't continue in the Lord. They don't continue. And you'll see them later on in life, backslid, amen, out in the world, unchurched, pawns of the devil, families in disarray, kids in the streets. Not only does God remove them from a church, he removed them from the body of Christ as well. Can I continue? And so the fruit that God desires and proclaims as necessary ingredients in the life of the believer are several. Number one is the fruit of the Spirit. He desires you to have the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Fruit of the Spirit. And it stands in contrast to the works of the flesh. If you read in Galatians chapter 5, it talks about all the different works of the flesh. Amen. He says the works of the flesh are manifest, but he desires that we walk in the Spirit. Secondly, he wants you to have the fruit of righteousness in your life. The Bible calls it the peaceable fruit of righteousness in Hebrews chapter 12 and, and Philippians chapter 1. He speaks of the peace. This fruit of righteousness, that is the outward or the, out, the outcome or the outward effect of the purging process. You'll have peace. When certain things, aspects, elements, or individuals are purged out of your life, you will have more peace than you've had in a long time. Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Then Matthew chapter 7 verse 16 speaks of knowing a person by their fruits. And this speaks of an individual's actions and an individual's works, their deeds, their behavior. In other words, the character of the fruit reveals the character of its root. A good tree cannot bring forth bad fruit. A bad tree, a corrupt tree, cannot bring forth good fruit. And so this speaks of an individual's conduct or attitude, or behavior, and practice. A good Christian, a genuine believer, simply will not do certain things. Well, well, put it this way. Will not habitually and willfully practice certain things. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3, he that is born of God cannot commit sin, but that word commit is from the Greek word poyo, which means to willfully and habitually practice. I'm not saying you'll never make mistakes. I'm not saying you'll never be overtaken in the fault, but you will not willfully and habitually practice without any regard at all for the, uh, the Holy Ghost. Amen. You will not just practice. You will just not do. You will not support or endorse or condone certain things as well. It's killing me how the church is turning on Kim Burrell. Now, I can understand the world turning on her. Then I saw some dude, and I didn't even get into it. I, mean, that's a, that's a, you know, I talked to her last Sunday night. I called her on the phone, and, and we talked, and I, uh, I comforted her and I encouraged her. And, you know, she was like, I ain't taking it back. I said, I'm going to come and do y'all like y'all did me, though. I'm going to encourage you in private. It's your fight. You fight it. Because I ain't see you standing with me when I was fighting mine. <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. Yeah. You fight your battle. I mean, I got, I, you know, but it's sad how, how, how the church is, is, is turning on her. I've seen some dude on social media talking about, say, if the church will learn how to interpret and intellectually exegete and exegete and, and homiletically, homiletically uh, homogenizingly interpret scripture, they would know that what she's saying is wrong. And so, yeah, a bunch of folks agreeing with him. And then I saw some guy came on there and said to him, uh, and it's all I could do to not jump in. But the guy came on there and said, hey, man, two, people getting, two men getting married in the church is an abomination like they did at yours. That's an abomination. Okay, so I said, I don't have to say nothing. He's, this dude got it. But, you know, you can't endorse and condone certain things and be a believer. You know what I'm saying? You just can't do it. Uh, I had somebody called me this morning about her and, and uh, I was 
He said, you know, she going through, I don't want to call his name. Now, I has a guy walking, he called me this morning. <laughs> like, she's going, <laughs> she's going, get him going through. And I talked to her, and uh, you think you can get her to sing at the inauguration? No, nah, man, I'm not doing that. No, no, get to sing at your stuff. I'm not getting nobody to do nothing. Amen. I'm going to get the people to sing the adoration that, that, need, that, that was there from the beginning. You know, okay. But, you know, I'm praying for it, but I, don't, I just don't understand how it's the church that's attacking her more than the world is for taking a stand against that which we consider to be sinful. Amen. So, once again, a corrupt tree can't bring forth good fruit. And a good tree can go bad. If it doesn't, if it doesn't get purged, it's say amen. amen. Now, John also, finally, John, John spoke uh, uh, talking about, he defines that souls that are won to the Lord, souls that are brought into the kingdom, he defines them as the result of ministry or he defines them as fruit as well. I remember when my wife first got saved, um, uh, this is the first time we heard the term, the young lady that had baptized her and was mentoring her somewhat. We went saved a couple of weeks and somebody walked up to her and said, looked at my wife and says, this your fruit? And, and, and she said, well, no, but I've taken her under my wing. You understand what I'm saying? So people want to the kingdom are looked upon as fruit as well. It's evident in that God desires there to be fruit in your life. He wants there to be fruit in your life personally and he wants to be fruit in your life professionally. When I say professionally, that's spiritually in regards to your Christian walk because the Bible says that we should walk worthy of the vocation that, to which we've been called. So a calling into service, amen, that's work. He wants you, that's your profession. Your profession is a Christian, amen. He wants there to be personal and professional fruit in your life. You have to develop personally into the image or the reflection of the Lord Jesus Christ. But your service to the Lord, amen, your Christian walk, your Christian life has to impact others to the extent that they desire to become a part of what you are a part of. Talk back to me. Every believer should impact somebody to the extent that they want to be a part of that which you, what your life represents. If it's just family members or your own children, you ought to be able to impact positively somebody enough to the extent that they want to have what you have. They want to be the way you are. Amen. Say amen. Say amen. Amen. Now, look at verse 15. He says, Henceforth I call you not servants. For the servant knows not what his Lord does, but I've called you friends. For all things that I've heard of my Father, I've made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you. And ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, notice something. When Jesus, and I want to look at this verse 16, take it apart a little bit. When Jesus said, you have not chosen me but I have chosen you the idea presented is the very opposite of what was practiced at that time amen in those days even as today the disciple chose his master the disciple chose who he would become a disciple of he chose whom he would follow the same way people today choose what church they want to be a part of you understand what I'm saying? One of the bedrocks of American society is the privilege to choose. Yeah. Even though man abuses that privilege by choosing the wrong things 99% of the time, amen, Eve chose to partake of the forbidden fruit. That was her choice. Man today chooses to partake of that which was forbidden by God, and man suffers the consequences thereof for their choices. But disciples, followers, and students then and now, they chose their master. They chose their rabbi. They chose their teacher. But Jesus reverses this order. Say amen. And he reverses this practice. And the reason he does so are obvious to those who even have a casual understanding of the word of God. The Bible states in 1 Samuel 16 and 7 that the Lord does not see as man sees. Because man looks at the outer form. Help me, Holy Ghost. Man looks upon the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at and on and into the heart. So in choosing the disciples, as well as everybody else throughout eternity, God chooses them. God chooses all. He chooses us from the standpoint 
of perfect knowledge. Luke 6, 12, and 13 implies that the Father instructed Jesus who to choose. If you read it in there, after Jesus had continued all night in fasting and prayer, the Father instructed him who to choose. Consequently, and I'm about to mess with some of y'all here, consequently, to find fault with the ones that are chosen is actually to find fault with the one who does the choosing, which is God. Back in 1970, when the when the when the Cavs uh, used to play down this Cleveland arena, back then in the NBA wasn't like it is today, and the Cavs had uh, took buses to nearby games. We were playing the Buffalo Braves, and it was in the middle of the winter. We were going to play Buffalo. You know, Buffalo gets hit like Cleveland, and the bus driver got lost in the midst of a snowstorm. And 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 the team almost forfeited the game. The Cavs got to the game like they came running in at tip off. And they, they delayed the game, didn't forfeit it for a few minutes, you know, to let them in. And as they're getting off the bus, all the players getting off the bus, the bus driver looked at the Cavs coach, Bill Fitch, and he said, man, I hope you're not mad at me for getting lost. And Bill Fitch said, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad at the people that hired you. <laughs> <laughs> Say amen, somebody. But see, we can't be like that with God. We can't find fault with the people that God chooses because to find fault with the ones that God chooses is to find fault with the God who chose them. To say that this person or that person should have never been chosen by God implies that you think you possess wisdom and knowledge that is superior to God. Say amen. But listen now, when God chooses an individual, when he chooses them for service, God knows exactly, watch this, and I want you to not to get it twisted. God knows exactly what that person has the potential to do, even until the end of their life. Now, remember what I said. A person actually has two destinies. You have a destiny with God and a destiny without God. You have a destiny in his will. You got a destiny out of his will. And you always at that fork in the road that I can go the right way which is his will, or go the wrong way, which is out of his will. He doesn't remove that choice from us. And so consequently, God gets to know certain things concerning the actions of free moral agents with the power of choice as they happen. Say amen. I mean, that's demonstrated in the Bible. He told Abraham, you can stay your hand from the child because now I know that you fear God. How do I know? Because of the choice that you made. You chose to obey my will. He told Moses, when you go to Israel to tell, when you go to uh, Israel to convince them that you're sent by me, if they don't obey sign one, do sign number two. If they don't obey sign two, do sign number three. I don't know how many signs it's going to take for these knuckleheads to believe because they're free moral agents with the power of choice. Come on, say amen to me. Now, God knows every possible choice that can be made, but he leaves it up to you to make it. So you never take him by, chance, by surprise. So when God chooses an individual, he knows exactly what that person has the potential to do to the end of their life. So God's choice is predicated, as I stated, on his perfect knowledge. However, his knowledge, watch this, and here's where a lot of people miss it. His knowledge of what they may do and his approval of what they may do are two entirely different dynamics. Knowledge of does not mean approval of. Yeah, I mean, because you know, I hear people, that, they love to use this argument, especially preachers these days, that if God knew what I was going to do, but chose me anyway, they somehow think that along with his choice of me came his approval of my behavior. You know, I've heard that rationale where he already knew what I was going to do before he called me. So I'm in this bed of fornication, but he knew I was going to do it anyway, and he called me anyway. But you still got to give an account. <laughs> Appro and knowledge of doesn't mean approval of. But he knows what you have the potential to do. He knows what everyone has the potential to do outside of his will. In other words, a lot of people endeavor to maintain that choice equals approval. 
that anointing equals approval. But touch somebody and say, that's a lie from the pit of hell. Right there. Yeah. Just because God knows, did, did God know Abraham would fall with uh, uh, Hagar? Did God know that David would fall with Bathsheba? He knew that the potential was there. But I'm going to get, you have to understand, watch this. When God chooses an individual for service, he knows exactly what that person has the potential to do. But here's what happens. Here's what you gain at salvation. You know, uh, you have a doctrine, uh, it's an erroneous doctrine called sinless perfection, which means that you can attain to the, such a position of spirituality that you are above temptation. You transcend the possibility to sin. That's a lie. So that we all found out the hard way. What you gain at salvation is the ability to refuse the bad and to choose the good. See, when you weren't saved, you didn't have the power to refuse the bad. The only power you had was to choose which bad you wanted to do. You gonna sin when you weren't saved, but you just at least you just had the choice. To like whatever sin you like, that's what. But once you get saved, you can choose not to sin. And any of you that have ever fallen before realize that you fell. When you fell, the choice was yours. You know, you didn't fall against your will. Come on, say amen to me. Now watch this. God's choice of a person is not made on the basis of what the person presently is. His choice of a person is made uh, based on what he can make of that person, what he could turn that person into. The Bible says when Saul, uh, when, when it said the Holy Ghost came upon Saul and he was turned into another man. When the, when the prophet uh, men, uh, laid hands on him. But so, so then God does not choose you based on the presence of good or bad or evil on that premise. Because if God chose on the premise of good or bad or evil, nobody would get chosen because he chose each of us to do good while we were still doing bad. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, watch this. God did not wait for you to get saved before he chose you. God chose you while you were unsaved. He chose you while you were in sin. He chose you while you were doing bad. Help me, Holy Ghost. The Bible says we were chosen in him from the foundation of the world. And actually, that simply refers to the church collectively. But that's another story. But, you know, I, I heard somebody, I heard somebody tell me, a, a, a great preacher, he and I had this argument because, you know, he's trying to justify some mess in his life. He said, well, I was chosen. Oh, I'm not going to imitate him. because <laughs> He said, I was chosen in him. He says, the Bible says, I was chosen in him before the foundation of the world. And I said, but you have to understand, his choice of you from the foundation of the world has to be matched by your choice of him in time and, and, and space. In other words, God's choice of me from the foundation of the world had to be matched by my choice of him in 1982. Just because he chose me doesn't mean I chose him. I chose my wife before she chose me. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all had to work? And you know, even now and then she reminds you, I don't even know why. Girl, because you couldn't resist the pressure, that's why. I'm just glad they didn't have the stalking laws back then that they have now. <laughs> Freddie laughing, I remember you used to stalk Chanel all over this sanctuary. Every ministry Chanel was in, Freddie joined. <laughs> we used to be saying, look at Freddie back there, think he's slick. <laughs> all of a sudden, he ushering. Then, then you know what you know what ministry you know what ministry Eddie Freddie got Elder Freddie got on this one he's really started getting his game on the envelope putting in the back of the chair ministry 
Because, you know, she be doing putting envelopes. Now he want to put envelopes in the back of the chairs after service, too, because now everybody gone. They still in here. It's taking four hours to put envelopes in the back of chairs now. Everybody else gone. They like, we got this ministry. Ain't nobody else got this. And they just, Freddie, he, he putting them envelopes? And, and, he, and he was talking. Say amen. And they've been happily ever after. <laughs> but, you know, God's choice of you has to be matched by your choice of him. Say amen. He cannot save us against our will, and he can't keep us against our will either. But he can choose me irregardless of my will, but he cannot use me irregardless of my will. Talk to me. And so now the world, and a major part of that which purports to be the church, they looks at in they, the world, and like I said, a major portion of the church, they look at individuals that are in the work of the Lord as being either qualified or disqualified according to their own rules or their own standards. But how many of you know God has his own rules? Which is why God disqualified Saul, even though Saul did nothing wrong in the eyes of people, but he qualified David, who committed murder, adultery, and the likes, because God looks at man, amen. God looks more in a person than God does at a person. And while David did indeed sin, David's genuine repentance prevented him from being disqualified by God. How many of you know everybody that is called, everybody that is chosen by God, you have to understand you're chosen for life. The Bible said the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance, which means that God does not remove, God does not lift the calling no matter what happens. But it is true that some or many even, they, they, they depart from the faith. Now, they're sheep, but they're lost sheep. How many of you know there's such a thing as a lost sheep? And there's such a thing as a lost son. Help me, Holy Ghost. Oh, I'm a son of God. Yeah, you're a lost son. But now, some may depart from the faith, but even if you depart from the faith, you're still responsible, and, and you have to be accountable for the call that God put on your life, and you're going to have to answer for it. Whether you walk in it or not, you're still responsible for it. If you return to God, if you return to the faith, then you are to immediately begin carrying out the call of God on your life again. But watch this, and, and, and some of you are going to be able to testify to this by way of experience, but don't raise your hand. It's very rare for a person that's been genuinely called by God to fall easily. Amen. He's like, I fell, but I fell slow. I didn't fall fast. It wasn't an easy fall, you know. I know people that have fallen. And y'all know anybody that fell? Any of y'all ever fell? <laughs> I know people that fell. I know of people that fell. But I don't know the tears they cried. I don't know the, the torment. I don't know the agony. I don't know the struggle. I don't know the spiritual warfare. I don't know the concentration of demonic activity that was levied against them. You have to understand. If Jesus had not been genuinely tempted in the wilderness, it wouldn't have been his. It wouldn't have been genuine temptation. If Jesus did not possess that's the potential to fall, then the ten, it would have been. There wouldn't have been genuine temptation. When the Bible says that Satan taketh him to the pinnacle of the temple, that word "taketh" means to drag by force. It means that Jesus, that Satan took Jesus all the way up to the top of the uh, pinnacle of the temple and told him to jump. Now, if, 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 if you were there and able to watch this guy, what would you see? You would see somebody that was in the grip of spiritual warfare. You would see somebody that here he is, he was all the way in the wilderness. Now he has to travel all the way to the temple. You would see a guy walking. Walking. You don't know. It seems like he's talking to himself. He's walking, walking. He goes all the way to the temple, goes up to the inside of the temple, goes up the steps, comes out on the roof, goes all the way up to the top, and is standing at the edge. This is what you would see. You would see somebody in the grips of spiritual war. You'd think he was crazy. Here's this guy looking raggedy and Kemp. He hasn't eaten in 40 days and 40 nights, and he's looking raggedy and dirty, and he's done, he done climbed up on the top of the temple. And look, y'all, he's about to jump. 
and all the demons in hell are on him. Jump, 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 jump. See, a lot of times what we call crazy is really spiritual warfare. And a lot of times what we look at people and we judge them for, you don't know what they're going through on the inside. You think it's just that easy for them to, 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 to drink that liquor. You think it's just so easy for them. Come on, talk back to me to fall into that vice. But you don't know the agony. You don't know the torment. You don't know the way they're trying to resist. You don't know how the devil is trying to push them and how the devil is trying to prompt them and how the devil is trying to tip them over to the other side. You don't know how they tried to resist. You don't know how many times they tried to stop. You don't know how many times they begged God to forgive them. You don't know how many times they prayed for deliverance. You don't know how many times they repented. You don't know how many times they remorsed until they were exposed and judged and condemned by people. See, that's why I'm not so quick to judge. And that's why I am quick to restore. Because you don't know, man, when people fall, it's a big issue when people fall that are saved and love the Lord. It's not as easy and if you found yourself in their shoes I never forget a great man said years ago a whole lot of Christians would be a whole lot better a, a, a whole lot better Christians if they would be knocked on their butt once or twice a time in their Christian walk because you learn co uh, compassion when you fall you learn how to have sympathy when you need some sympathy you know how to be less judgmental when you don't want people judging you. You know how to be less critical when everybody is criticizing you. Talk back to me, somebody. What time is it? Almost time to go. Let me conclude with this. Verse 16 presents the highest achievement in the life of anybody that is called or chosen by God, and that is to bring forth fruit. The fruit of the spirit, the peaceable fruit of righteousness, the fruit of a spirit led life, and the fruit of souls to the kingdom and to the church. And not only that, to bring forth fruit, saints of God, not only that you have a productive walk with God, but that your fruit should remain, amen, the fruit of your life, the fruit of your works, the fruit of your ministry, the fruit of your Christian walk. Because he said in verse 16 that if the fruit in your life is brought forth and remains, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. In other words, what he was saying is that answered prayer is conditioned upon a fruitful walk with God. You want God to answer your prayers? Then have a fruitful Christian walk. If you don't have any fruit, you will not get your prayers answered. If you don't have any fruit, you will not get blessed. Y'all got to be my best in God. And I've got to do my best for God. If I expect to be able to get a prayer to, if I expect to be able to get a breakthrough, if the desire of my heart are going to be made manifest in my life. I've got to make full proof of my ministry. I've got to make my calling and my election sure. I've got to fight the good fight of faith and run with patience this race that is set before me. And touch somebody say, I've got to bring forth fruit in my season. The Bible says, blessed is the man that walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the way of the sinner, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his the light is in the law of the Lord and in his law does he meditate day and night and he shall be like a tree planted by rivers of water that brings forth his fruit in his season he said his leaf shall not wither his fruit shall not wither his character his works shall not wither they will endure they will remain they will persevere they'll stand the test of time and as a result whatsoever he does shall prosper Somebody lift him up and give him a praise right there. If you want your prayer answered, then bring forth fruit. If you want God to bless you, bring forth fruit. If you want to make your way prosperous, bring forth fruit. If you want good success, bring forth fruit. If you want a breakthrough, if you want a turnaround, if you want a promotion, if you want an increase, touch somebody and say, bring forth fruit, bring forth fruit. Look at somebody and say, you need to examine yourself. While I examine myself, I'm going to ask myself, am I beneficial to the kingdom? Am I productive in my service for the Lord? Because if I'm not, God's going to remove me. I don't want God to remove me. I don't want him to set me aside. I want him to use me any way he sees fit. Shout about it. You know why some people aren't in the kingdom anymore? Because God removed them. 
Come on, talk back to me right there. Touch somebody and say, I'm not going to get moved. And I'm not going to get removed. I'm going to walk this walk. I'm going to live this life holy, acceptable to God. That's my reasonable service. I'm going to bring forth fruit in my season. I'm going to walk with God. I'm going to talk with God. I'm going to live for God. I'm going to work for God. Come on, clap your hands, open up your mouth, and give God all the praise you can give him right now. Touch somebody and say, I don't know about you, but God chose me. I'm special. I'm somebody because God chose me, but he chose me to bring forth fruit. And I don't know about anybody else. My fruit's going to remain. Mine is going to remain. I'm going to have a fruitful, productive life because I'm connected to the Lord my God. I'm going to stay connected and I'm going to be fruitful. So that when I do stand before him, he will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter in to the glory of the Lord. Come on, clap your hands, open up your mouth and give him all the praise you can give him right now. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him praise. Give him glory. Give him honor. Shout about it. Lift your hand. Father, in the magnificent, spectacular name of Jesus, whose we are and whom we serve, we thank you once again. Once again, we thank you for allowing us access into your holy presence. We thank you for allowing us to worship you and allowing us to praise you and allowing us to partake of your word in spirit and in truth and in the liberty that our great country provides. Now I pray for each and every one of these great precious believers under the sound of my voice. I pray for all those that have pressed tonight through inclement weather, O oh Lord, to hear what thus saith the Lord. I pray that you meet every need that they have in their life. And that even as you purge their lives, oh Lord, the process will not be painful. It will not be damaging, but it will be, amen, profitable for their well-being. I pray, oh Lord, I pray, oh Lord, that you bless them exceeding and abundantly above all that they can ask or think. That you bring them through their process unscathed, oh Lord. That there be no damage, there be no hurt, there be no pain, amen that leaves scars and after effects, O oh Lord, that I pray that you bring them out of their process of purging so that they can walk in the realm of perfection, O oh Lord, even as you perfect that which concerns them. Pray that you perfect their homes, their families, perfect them physically, mentally, and spiritually, perfect them financially, O oh Lord. Cause increase to come from the north, the south, the east, and the west, O oh Lord. Give them, bless them with the desires of their heart because they endeavor to lead lives that are pleasing unto you. Let them bear much fruit spiritually and materially, O oh Lord. Let them have a productive material, physical life as well as a productive spiritual life. Give them an increase in goods, O oh Lord, and possessions, O oh Lord. Bless them. Not selfishly, but needfully. Bless them, O oh Lord, liberally. Bless them deservedly. And we give you the the credit for every blessing we receive we'll acknowledge, we'll attribute them all to you and praise and worship and give you glory in Jesus name, if you're in agreement shout amen. amen, clap your hands open up your mouth and give him praise one more time well that's just about it for tonight, saints of God I pray that you are blessed, I pray that you learned something in by and through that uh, word that was just delivered something that can enhance your Christian walk something that can enhance your natural life and contribute to your overall well-being. Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Amen. And so once again, there are principles, precepts in his word that aid and assist us, aid and abet us in the living of this life that God desires us to live. God doesn't want us to be miserable and unhappy. Amen. Uh, you know, conflict, adversity, 
um, trials and tribulations. They're part of this world. They're part of this life that we live, but they're not all of it because the Bible says, thanks be unto God who always causes us to triumph. So God wants us to be overcomers. You can't be an overcomer if you have not been in a battle. You can't be a conqueror if you have not had any conflict. You can't triumph if you haven't had any turmoil to triumph over. But there are principles and precepts he gives us once again that aid and abet us into living up this life that can produce fruit that can abound to our account, as the Apostle Paul said. Amen. So I pray that you take what you've learned, put it into practice. Don't just be hearers of the word, but be doers as well. And I guarantee it'll cause you to have a better life. Amen. Amen. Listen, let's prepare to bless the Lord right now through the giving of our material gifts. We're going to pay our tithe and or give the Lord our very best offering on tonight. Amen. Even in the bearing of fruit, there is no fruit bearing unless there has first been seed sowing. There is no harvest reaped unless there is a seed sown. Harvest time follows seed time. Seed time and harvest. Seed time and harvest. Amen. And any fruit that abounds, amen, is the result of seed that has been sown. So we want to sow our seed on tonight into the kingdom of God. We want to sow it through the local church, New Spirit Revival Center. And we're believing that there's going to be a harvest because there is a harvest attached to every seed that you sow. Amen. When we pay our tithe here, the Bible says that God receives it in the spirit realm of whom it is witness that he lives. So in other words, in the book of Hebrews, he's saying that when we pay our tithe, we're acknowledging the life, the resurrection, the lordship of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I want you to go to Givelify.com, G-I-V-E-L-I-F-Y.com, amen, or text to give, tithely, PayPal, whatever platform that you utilize, and sow your seed into the kingdom of God via New Spirit Revival Center on tonight. This is a special year for us, amen. Actually, it's a special month. It marks our 30th year of ministry. Phew, it goes fast, believe me. It goes fast. Amen. David said, I've been young, but now I'm old. And I can say the same thing regarding new spirit. I've been young, but now I'm old, but I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed begging bread. You know, I always put a fleece before God when we first started. I said, Lord, as long as you meet the needs of the ministry, I'll know you're in it. And he has been faithful thus far. Amen. And using you to help meet the needs of New Spirit Revival Center. You, you don't, some of you don't even realize that is the call of God on your life to sow seed into new spirit. He told Elijah, get thee down to Zarephath. I've commanded a widow woman to sustain you there. In Zarephath, this widow woman had only a little. She like, all I have is enough for me and my son. And after that, we're going to run out. We're probably going to starve to death afterwards. But one thing she didn't know, she was under the, he said, I've commanded her. God put it in the past tense. She had a call on her life. She had an unction on her life. She had a directive on her life. She had a command on her life from God to sustain the ministry of the prophet Elijah. And in sustaining him, she herself was sustained. And there are a number of us who are sustaining and 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 and. Sowing into New Spirit Revival Center. Let me tell you something. We don't know what has been averted or caused in our life. Amen. We don't know, you know, that that we have uh, our life and we have our, our children and we have whatever we have. We don't know that what of it is the result of us sowing into this ministry. She didn't realize her and her son's life depended upon her sowing into Elijah's ministry. And as a result, increase came her way. She reaped a harvest because she sowed into the ministry of God, which was represented, amen, in Elijah. And a lot of you don't know what's going on in your life, what the positive benefits have been for you sowing into New Spirit Revival Center, amen. But I know one thing, I, I know of, an, and I'm not saying this to try to scare anybody, I don't, I don't do that stuff, but I do, do know this, I know a lot of people whose lives were going in a different direction when they were members and, and participants 
in New Spirit Revival Center. That as they got disconnected from New Spirit Revival Center, I see, and, and I don't rejoice in it. And I don't be like, see, that's what you get. I actually feel sorry for them. I've seen some of their children harmed or gone off in a different direction. Children that were one time in Sunday school and loving the Lord that they, they went off. I saw them go off. I saw some, and there are even those that, to be quite honest, have wound up in the grave. Amen. Because they got back into a lifestyle that caused them to lose their life. Amen. I know some that are in the penitentiary because they've got back into a lifestyle that caused them to wind up in the penitentiary. But while they were functioning members of New Spirit Revival Center, they were doing good. And I don't, I, I, I feel bad for them. I feel sorry. I feel sorry that it occurred that way. So I said that to say this, stay connected to your source. Amen. If the source of your spiritual enrichment is New Spirit Revival Center, if this is the ministry that feeds you spiritually, then amen, then you sow back into the ministry. If, if, if you receive fruit from a tree, then it's your job to water that tree. <laughs> if you're receiving fruit from the ground, from the soil, it's your job to water that soil and tend to that soil so that it can continue to produce good fruit in your life. Amen. Pay your tithe. Give the Lord your very best offering. Once again, 30 years. We're, we're, this is our 30th year of ministry in a month. We'll be celebrating our first Sunday service. We actually began our Bible studies uh, this month, February in 1994. And um, once again, time flies. And you, you know what? I, I, I really, you know, you ask God certain things when you ask God why. And, you know, oftentimes we say, Lord, why me when it's something bad? But I also say, why me or why us when it's something good? Because a whole lot of churches started in 1994 that are not around today. A whole lot of pastors began when my wife and I began, and they're not pastoring today. Uh, I know some pastors, you know, young pastors, when we first started out, there was, there was a cluster of us that started in 1994, and those others, they're not, the, those churches don't exist today, or they're not in Cleveland, Ohio, or those pastors aren't pastoring today. And you know what else I, I find significant? That there has been a changing of the guard in the city in the sense that a number of the premier churches in the greater Cleveland area that were around when we started, not around anymore. And some of them, if they are around, they, they, they don't have the, 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 the uh, prominence that they once had, or the church is still there, but the pastors that were very prominent at that time, they're not there. And you know, I'm not too shy or too proud to say that we stand on the shoulders of our predecessors and we just pray that we've made a mark and we've left a legacy in this city, amen, and across this country, amen, that cannot be erased and that there are younger ministries coming up or that have come up that are standing on our shoulders as well. I said that to say this, New Spirit Revival Center is good ground. We have a proven track record, 30 years of ministry. Now, that's, a, that's a long time. That's a long time. I look back, I was just a, I was just a boy preacher. <laughs> and I'm still, now I'm a young man preacher. I went from a young boy, from a boy preacher to a young man preacher. <laughs> My wife was a girl preacher to a young lady preacher now. Amen, amen. Pay your tithe, sow your seed. I want you to sow, if you can, if you can help us, you can sow a commemorative seed of $30 on tonight, over and above what you were going to do to commemorate our 30 years in, in as a church, I've been longer than 30 years in ministry, but 30 years as a church, if you can sow an over and above $30 seed tonight, amen, there will be a harvest attached to that seed. All right? All right. We'll be in church on this Sunday, 3130 Mayfield Road. You know what I find unusual and I thank the Lord for is the fact that we're in the same building that we started in. We started at 3130 Mayfield Road, most churches go through a lot of transition. When they begin, they'll start in one location, move to another location, move to another location until they finally arrive at their permanent uh, destination. And we walked in the New Spirit Revival Center. We walked into 3130 Mayfield Road. And I remember I used to say back then, and the prior owners of the building used to get mad. I used to say, this is my building. This is my building. And we started off just renting a room. Now we, we own the entire 130,000 square feet, nothing but God. He gets all the credit for all the good. I take blame for all the bad. If there's any bad attached to it, it's all my fault, amen? 
But we'll be there this Sunday, 10, 15 a.m. I want to see a face in the place, help set an atmosphere of praise and worship, break up any fallow ground, create an atmosphere conducive for a move of the spirit, and the word of God is going to go forth. If you absolutely, positively, without a doubt, can't be there, but you still want to participate in the service, we'll be right here online at 11 o'clock sharp. Amen? All right. Well, until then, the blessing of the Lord be upon you, and I bless you in the name of the Lord.